Welcome to the Computational Fabrication Seminar. A web series showcasing new research, exciting ideas, and exchanging thoughts. Our weekly one-hour live sessions rotate through three different time zones and are jointly organized by ISD Austria, University of Washington, and Singapore University of Technology and Design. Each session starts with a motivational opening talk given by an expert from industry or a field related to computational fabrication, such as robotics, computer graphics, mechanical engineering, material science, HCI, applied math, design, or architecture. The motivational talk is followed by a technical deep dive. We invite our audience to ask questions during the talks via YouTube comments and join us afterwards on Discord. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michal Piovacci, and I will be the host for today. And the theme of this week is textiles and cloth. It is my great pleasure to introduce our motivational speaker for today, Steve Marshall. Steve is a professor of computer science at Cornell University, where he is conducting research in computer graphics and computer vision, centered around modeling the optics and mechanics of materials for applications in rendering, animation, and fabrication. And today, his talk will be about how can graphics change manufacturing. And Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. So I, I come to fabrication from a background in graphics. And one of the questions that I often hear from colleagues when I'm explaining to them about fabrication work that I've done or that I'm interested in uh, one of the questions is why is this, how is this related to graphics? Uh, I thought you're supposed to be making pictures. Um, and so I wanted to say a little bit about sort of how I see graphics as related to fabrication. Uh, fabrication is related to graphics and how maybe it's more natural than it seems. Uh, and uh, talk a little bit about some of my work in weaving uh, as an example uh, and finish up with uh, some speculation about maybe where this is going and, and how this can all change the world. So computer graphics has really always, from the beginning of the field, targeted both the real world and imaginary worlds. So early work in uh, modeling was, was used to do CAD, to, to uh, visualize architecture, um, and also to make uh, art and to make animation. And um, a lot of the, the tools that were developed for modeling things in the real world, modeling and making CAD models, uh, were adopted in modeling and animation software. Um, Likewise, uh, we eventually started realizing we needed better models for the physics of light reflection and light transport. And uh, this, a lot of this work came from uh, simulations uh, or, or work that had been done on lighting simulation and heat transport simulation. Um, as animation started to develop the need for better uh, automatic simulation kind of secondary motions, like the things that are, arise naturally from physics that are very hard to animate manually, um, we started to mine the literature of um, mechanical and structural engineering uh, for uh, rigid body and deformable solid uh, simulators, uh, the aerospace and other literatures for uh, techniques to use for fluid animation, um, and the textiles literature for uh, an understanding of what cloth is and how it works uh, so that we could make cloth simulators. But it's interesting because uh, even starting back at the beginning, uh, this, this uh, flow is not a one way flow. So, um, I mean, CAD modeling techniques uh, or software and modeling and animation packages for, for animation uh, really developed hand in hand and passed uh, ideas and techniques back and forth. Um, Physics-based rendering when it started out was really borrowing from engineering disciplines, but now if you look at lighting simulation software, it's using techniques that were developed for rendering uh, for making images. And uh, closer to home for me in, in cloth, uh, if you look at the history of textile CAD software, um, uh, CAD or computer systems have long been used to design fabrics and to, to design the patterns for garments. Um, but when those systems wanted to have draping simulations, uh, they borrowed the technology directly from the cloth simulations that had been uh, that had been built for computer graphics. And that's an area where now those two applications are sort of you know, like uh, on an equal basis motivating the ongoing work on, on cloth simulation. So I think that we're we've always seen this two-way street, and we're at a time now where we're seeing. Uh, 
a lot of these simulation tools that we build for imaginary worlds uh, starting to be applied more for real things. Uh, so some of the, the uh, more advanced versions of uh, simulation tools for animation are really now quite accurate models of the way the world is. Um, and they're a little different than the tools that are uh, usually found in other fields because they are focused on really handling very complex uh, environments or complex uh, models. Um, and being computer graphics people and computer scientists, we love to uh, build systems that help manage complexity and that work for really large examples. And I think that one of the things we are doing uh, and can do uh, with these, this technology is to um, not just bring techniques for describing the shape of things uh, in, the, in the virtual world and use them to describe shape of what things that we're designing, but take the rest of the understanding of the rest of the properties of the world, what it looks like, how it moves, how it, how it behaves, um, and make design tools that understand all those things. Um, so that you have design tools that are not just describing what the shape of things is, but are describing what they really are. Um, and uh, this kind of software can be much more of a partner uh, than an assistant. And I think in some sense, that's the, the core of a lot of uh, ideas in computational fabrication is to make uh, software that works with you to design and make things um, rather than just being an assistant that automates the, the, the complicated work. So I wanna uh, show you some, uh, some of my own work kind of as an example of this process. Um, so some years ago, uh, Doug James and I with our student, uh, John Caldor, um, got to working on yarn-based simulation for graphics. Um, and this was uh, a different way of simulating cloth because it is, uh, it's, um, it, it's modeling the, the interaction of yarns uh, rather than the, just the motion of the entire sheet. And our initial motivation was to get very detailed animation so that you could see all the structure, uh, the texture of the cloth, how it changes as you move around. Um, and uh, the, uh, we scaled this up to, to larger examples. Um, uh, working with Chem Yuxel, uh, we made uh, some uh, techniques for making very detailed uh, knit patterns so that you could have uh, complicated structures that actually resembled the real structures pretty closely. But at that time, our, our focus our motivation for all of this was not because we actually wanted to help make them, um, but because we wanted to make better pictures of them, better pictures of um, imaginary uh, garments for imaginary creatures. Um, but after we had done a bunch of this, one of the things that was interesting about this work was how well a simple model of yarn interaction can predict the properties and behavior of, of cloth at a larger scale. Um, and in more recent work, we've really been focusing on how do you take the same technology, this yarn-based simulation technology, um, and apply it to the problem of making real stuff uh, and making real stuff uh, that, is, that, is, uh, that is better, more predictable, easier to design than you otherwise would be able to. Um, so this applies in a number of different kinds of textiles. Um, so uh, so um, uh, automated knitting is one example the video will talk about. Um, and I wanna talk about 3D knitting, I'm, I'm sorry, 3D weaving. Um, so in a project called Weavecraft, um, we looked at uh, the, the problem of design for 3D weaving. So let me give a little gloss on weaving and 3D weaving first. So weaving is basically a process that starts with an, an array of parallel yarns that are called the warp. Uh, and then you interlace yarns through that that go in a perpendicular direction that are called the weft. Um, and most weaving uh, is treats that, that warp as a one-dimensional array of yarns. And the difference in 3D weaving is that you have a two-dimensional array of warp yarns. Um, and this is a small change. Uh, you really use most of the same equipment uh, in, in this weaving, but it's a big change to the design prop problem. Uh, so you can see on the, on the lower right, uh, some examples of 2D on the top uh, weaving patterns. Some 2D weaving patterns are you know, one or, or two or three layers thick. Um, but a 3D weaving pattern on the, on the bottom, which is, a, this is still a fairly thin one, but it, it shows how you have to really switch how you're thinking about the routing of yarns. It's a very three-dimensional problem now. Um, so 3D weaving is typically used for composites. So uh, uh, composites like carbon fiber uh, polymer composites where uh, you are embedding something, uh, some fibers into a material to make it stronger. And the big advantage of 3D weaving there is that you have uh, interlaced matrix in all directions so the material can't come apart and fail by delamination. And the, the way that this manufacturing is typically done is to manufacture big chunks of homogeneous cloth once you figured out what the pattern is. 
uh, uh, you design these patterns mostly by scratching your head and fiddling on graph paper and then running it over and over again until you get a pattern that you like. Um, that's maybe a slight exaggeration. There are some software tools that help with that. Um, but, but, but because it's difficult to design new patterns, people typically just work with uh, repeated patterns uh, and the cloth that comes from that. So what we wanted to do is enable not just making objects out of textiles, so like making a uniform sheet of material and then making something out of it, but making textile objects directly. This is a familiar idea from, the, from fully fashioned knitting um, that you don't have to cut and sew to make something. You can just make it all in one piece. So we wanted to do that with 3D weaving, but in, in, uh, in volumetric uh, application rather than in a, a sheet-like application. So we, the first work in this, in this direction, although the, the publications were in the other order, but the first thing we did was to build Weavecraft, which is a, a CAD system essentially for supporting people who want to design really complicated 3D woven structures. Um, so here are examples uh, running from left to right of uh, the Weavecraft interface where you can route yarns in slices of material. And then a couple of views of uh, that picture translated into 3D. And then at the right, a couple of views of what our simulator predicts as the relaxed state of those, uh, those materials. And you can see a lot happens when you do the weaving and let the yarn, uh, you know, yarn interactions and the, the physics that happens there play out. Um, and that physics is really important part of the design of these fabrics. So you can't really do the design just believing that all of the yarns stay where they are on your graph paper, that they, they move uh, in the weaving process. And that simulation is important. So the other thing that this system lets you do is to build uh, more complicated sort of non-stationary structures. Um, and an example uh, which sort of motivated us throughout this whole project was a shoe. Um, this is something that our, our, um, our collaborators at, um, I just realized that I changed the name of the project one slide too early up in the top, so this is still Weavecraft. Um, the, our collaborators at RISD had wanted to make uh, a shoe by 3D weaving uh, as a design sort of grand design challenge. And, it was incredibly difficult to do this uh, by manually arranging weave patterns. And it was really only once they had our software that they were able to build uh, the shoe that you see here uh, that contains uh, zillions of different patterns that play out in different areas. Um, and it still required a number of trials to actually get there, um, but, the, but having the software system uh, really let you get there a lot faster. So, this is an example of a CAD system with a simulation module that helps you understand uh, what your, what your uh, objects will do. And I guess for full disclosure, I should say the simulator can't scale up to the finished shoe. It can, it can simulate various pieces of it, but not the entire thing. Um, so the next project that we did in, in, this, uh, in this series is one that we, uh, we call WeavePrint. Uh, which is to try to make this a little bit more like 3D printing to give the user a higher level interface uh, to the system where instead of describing the weave patterns that you want and uh, giving the user complete control over every detail, which is sort of the purpose of WeaveCraft, um, but to, to let the user specify the desired shape. Um, and in WeavePrint, the desired shape is specified as a height field. So it works with relief shapes. Um, I think it's a really interesting extension to uh, start looking at how could you do a completely arbitrary shape? And there are a lot of tricky questions about yarn routing that show up there, but I think some of them could be solved. Um, and the basic idea of how it works is it, it takes that height, height field, uh, thinks of it in terms of a perpendicular sets of slices. So there are slices in the warp direction and slices in the weft direction. Um, each of those slices gets a, a yarn uh, routing across the, the whole area designed um, following kind of the rules of construction for certain types of fabrics. Um, and then altogether, that makes an interlaced structure uh, that, that will hold together. There are some interesting details about what you have to do at the surface to make sure that the thing is clean and stays together on the surface. Um, but ultimately, then what you have is a weave pattern that you can feed to the manufacturing equipment. It's, it's basically just a binary image that says, when does every yarn go up and down in the process? Um, and so here are the results of feeding a few different height fields into this uh, from sort of test shapes like Gaussian bumps and pyramids to the obligatory bunnies and teapots uh, and some other shapes here. One thing I have to say that, we're, that we are not seeing here is that there's a one step between the weaving and the, and the, uh, the end state, which is um, at least in many cases, you have weft yarns, uh, sorry, warp yarns that are not used throughout the entire volume that come out of the surface and then you have to trim them at the surface. And uh, 
the fabric on layer on the surface is designed to kind of retain those so nothing unravels, but they do have to be trimmed. And that's currently a manual process. So that's a, a exploration of a particular kind of, uh, of manufacturing process uh, and how you can uh, enable a lot more to be done with, uh, with software that supports complex designs. And you, you might ask, well, where is this going? Like, how, how is this going to change the world? Like an awful lot of stuff that we do in fabrication, especially in the graphics literature, uh, people will sometimes criticize it as like, oh, you're just making bunnies and teapots. Like, well, how is that ever going to change anything? Um, and I think that what we're really trying to do is, is nothing less than completely change how we would think about the relationship between manufacturing and modeling things. So I'll use a, a shoe as an example. This is not a 3D woven shoe, but a, but a, a regular old shoe that might contain some woven fabrics, that might contain some uh, custom knitted things like maybe a, a shaped upper or something like that. Um, and there are computer systems to, to support each of the different kinds of things you need to do. So uh, you use a computer to design weaving patterns, to design uh, knitting patterns. Uh, you use CAD software to, to describe your sewing patterns. And each of those sort of feeds into one step of the manufacturing process. Um, and then at the end, these days, of course, everybody needs to have a, a computer graphics model of everything that they want to sell so they can show it spinning in 3D on their website and, and customize it and everything. Um, and currently in this world, you would just, at the end, you would give the finished shoe to a 3D artist and ask them to make you the graphics model. So it's completely unrelated to all the rest of this. And I think this is a little silly to have all these separate models. And, and you could imagine moving this toward a place where you have uh, a much more integrated model. Um, so a model that, that contains the information about how fabrics are woven, how fabrics are knitted, how the whole thing is assembled. Maybe it even has sewing instructions for automated, uh, automated cutting and sewing. Um, and it also knows about the properties of the materials involved um, in such a way that uh, you can actually predict the whole shape and performance of the object and even have a model that is good enough to do graphics, uh, to do rendering with. Um, and then this model would feed you know, the same kinds of instructions that are needed for all the different state steps of assembly. Um, but this could be really powerful because you have now a, a complete model of your object all the way from the beginning. And you can ask questions like, if I were to use a different yarn in the fabric, how would that change everything? So it changes the properties of the fabric. It might make, require some changes to the sewing pattern. It'll change the appearance. Um, and if you can know all of this, then you can make tweaks and optimizations across this entire pipeline uh, that are just not possible now where everything is so siloed. So this is just, uh, the shoe is just an example here. Um, you could do this with garments. You could do this even with buildings in an architectural setting where you're uh, keeping, I mean, people already are keeping quite complete models of buildings that they're building, but taking it really, making it really, really end to end uh, is sort of part of the vision here. So coming back again to the question uh, that I kind of started with. It's why, why is this graphics? Um, or why is graphics involved with this? Um, and I think one of the reasons is just that we like to build uh, simulations of complicated things. Um, but that's not, not really unique. Lots of fields build simulations of complicated things. Uh, and I think one of the things that the computer graphics community does that's useful is it provides a kind of a sandbox environment called uh, techniques for doing animation in virtual worlds. Uh, or techniques uh, that are applied to entertainment where the accuracy requirements are not quite so high as if I'm actually making things, if I have a robot that has to work, uh, if, you know, if I have a, a building that has to stand. Um, and it gives us a chance to work on uh, sort of more ambitious, bigger scale simulations, even when it's gonna take years and years to get them to the point where they could be used for real applications. Um, and I think that this uh, kind of incubator field where you can, you can uh, incubate ideas within this virtual context um, is one of the reasons why graphics, I think, is a, an important piece of the fabrication puzzle. All right, so that's, that's all I have for now. And I'm excited to see videos talk next. Oh, thank you very much for the exciting talk. And I would like to remind the audience to post their questions in the chat for the joint questions and answers at the end of the session. And today our deep dive speaker is Vidya Narayan. And Vidya is his final year PhD student at Carnage Dawan University, advised by James McCann. She's associated with the textiles lab at CMU and is broadly interested in computational tools for application, computer graphics, and visualization. Her current research focuses on computational textiles, particularly machine learning. 
And she has previously interned at Adobe Disney Research and has a master's degree from India Institute of Science and Scientific Visualization. And the idea will give us now a deeper view on 3D machine learning. Thank you, Michael, for that very nice introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be presenting my work today in the seminar series. Thank you for having me. Today, I want to give you all an introduction to 3D machine knitting. So what's common to your shoes, sweaters, socks, even maybe your office chair or your car seat? Turns out that these are all made with knitting. They're all knit fabric. And, be and besides these everyday uh, structures, and garments, knitting also appears in a lot of other interesting places. For example, these um, soft skins for robots, these gloves are soft skins for robots are used for virtual interaction. In construction and manufacturing, there's a, this is a knit uh, skateboard. There's an example here of a carbon fiber reinforced knit turbine part. Knitting also appears a lot in medicine, right from compression socks to even hard wall parts. But what do I really mean when I say all these objects are knit? Well, what I mean is that if you zoom into these objects, they have a very similar structure. What happens here is that a strand of yarn is taken and it's turned into loops. And these loops are intermeshed through other loops to form a stable structure that wouldn't fall apart. So it turns, turns that into fabric. Now, this is similar to weaving that uh, Steve Marshner spoke about, where but the similarity is that they both are arrangements of yarn in various ways, but then the structure itself is very different from weaving. Here you have this loop through loop structure. So if you zoom in to say your t-shirt or something like that and notice this particular loop through loop structure, then what you're looking at is a knit fabric. Now in the industry commercially, how are all these objects made? Well, they're made on a machine like one of these. These are all examples of knitting machines. They all have different capabilities. But again, if you zoom into one of these complicated systems, what you'll notice is that they're made of these many tiny needles that can be programmed into manipulating yarn into knit structures. The big challenge in machine knitting, of course, is that programming these machines are hard. Each of these machines come with their own uh, proprietary hardware, which may not, uh, proprietary software may not, which may not be particularly easy to use for a non-expert. Uh, there's no obvious way to figure out if a particular design or target that you have in mind can even be made on a particular machine. And there's no unified representation across these machines and these systems to talk about knitting. Now, in order to tackle these challenges, what we need to understand is, well, how do these machines work? How are they made? And what can these machines in turn make? So that's what I'll talk about today. And I'll also briefly talk about how should we represent machine knitting programs especially when we want to talk about making complex 3D shapes. So let's look at what knitting machines can make. So knitting, as I mentioned, involves loops. So there needs to be a way to make and store them. And that's where these needles come in. Here I have an example of a needle that, can, that has a hook-like shape at the end of it, and these hooks can store loops. The needle really is a tiny machine. If you place a yarn in front of it, it can grab that yarn, turn it into a loop, and pull it through the loops that it's holding. So this is an operation that a machine needle can make. We'll call this the knit operation. Think of it as the only operation that this needle can actually make. Now, storage is temporary in the sense that once the yellow loop gets, a green loop gets formed through the yellow loop, the yellow loop is dropped. It's only held by the green loop, and the green loop is active on the machine. So what can we do with these needles? Well, we can arrange a bunch of these needles in different ways to get different styles of machines. So here's an example. This is called a linear single bit machine where all I've done is taken a bunch of these needles and laid them out in a line. But now we can start making fabric. Well, let's add a yarn carrier to the system, a little mechanical piece that can bring some yarn in front of these needles. So here, this green yarn carrier has bought some yarn in front of the first needle. The first needle has grabbed it and made a loop. Now the yarn carrier moves forward uh, to the second needle. Again, the second needle grabs and makes a loop. And the yarn carrier proceeds forward like so. So now you have a little swatch of a knit fabric on your linear machine. Now the yarn carrier can also move backwards, which means along the backward path as well, you can start making loops. And now it's easy to imagine that as you move 
forward and backward, you can start trivially making these sheets. Now, because the yarn carrier can travel back and forth, it can also make shorter trips. For example, here I've used a red color yarn carrier that moves across the first two needles. They make loops, then it moves back, creating additional loops on just the first two needles. So the first two needles have five loops each. The last two needles still have three loops, and those loops weren't touched by um, the procedure that was done with the red yarn carrier. And they're held securely until the green carrier comes back and lift and creates new loops through them. So if we look at the topology of the yarn path itself, that might seem fairly complicated. But the surface that was constructed is just a sheet. And why do we know that? Because these linear, these needles in this linear machine can basically access a 2D plane across time. And all we really did while knitting was create some uh, patches of fabric at some regions in this particular uh, plane. And of course, exactly how you connect these stitches uh, can introduce boundaries. So you can have a sheet with boundaries, but basically you have a sheet-like structure. Now we can make some observations about the surface that we're constructing here. Because these loops were generated one after the other, this is an additive fabrication process. So the loops were generated one after the other row by row. That means they, have, they, they occur at different time, points in time. And we can apply onto the surface that was constructed a sort of time function that basically records when was the loop that made this part of the surface created on the machine. So this time function obviously has a upward direction because once you drop a loop, you can't access it again. And this has a particular order to it. Now, if we look at the isocontours or points in this time function that have the same value, they form these equally spaced open curves. And what this basically is, is the rows that we used to construct this knit fabric. So in general, we can think about this problem of constructing knit fabric. We can turn that problem into a problem of thinking about how do we come up with these surface functions that have some nice property. For example, here we know that these contours are little open curves, and those open curves can be held on this linear machine. And that's an intuition we've used repeatedly. Now, the term linear machine that can make sheet-like surfaces might seem fairly restrictive, but the design space is pretty interesting. For example, here is an elbow-like shape from which I've cut out a little uh, piece just to make sure that it is topologically a sheet. And even though I've not exactly mentioned how we came up with this pattern, it should be fairly uh, convincing that a linear machine can indeed make such a shape because it is technically just a topological sheet. So this is an example of a pattern created on just a linear machine fabricated to cover this elbow shape. And there's, there's no additional post-processing here. So to recap, the single bed machine could make topological flat sheets. In the knitting world, they end up calling these kind of machines flat knitting machines because typically they are used to build, uh, make large yards of flat fabric that are then used in various ways. But you can use them to uh, make pretty much a topologically, a, 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 she, a, a, a shaped 3D object as long as it's topologically sheet-like. Now, earlier I had mentioned that socks are knit, but quite clearly this machine cannot make socks. But we can try a different arrangement of these needles. So we can place our needles in a circular way. Now we have a circular knitting machine. The needles, again, can do exactly the same thing that your previous needles could do. They can start making loops. But the yarn carrier need not go just back and forth. It can go round and round, which means that now you can start making tubes. So if we think about the sort of layer or support structure over which this machine works, well, you have a circle that's been extruded upward in time. So you have something like a cylindrical structure. So you can work with the cylinder. So now if I think about constructing this particular sock on a circular knitting machine, I can think about this pattern as, well, I just need to stack a bunch of cylinders uh, with various types of yarns to get something sock-like. And of course, you can still make those short trips. You can make those short rows, which means that you can fill in a partial cylinder instead of going all the way around. And that's what gives the little bulge and the heel in the sock. So again, uh, everything that we said about linear machines continues to be true for these circular machines. We can hold uh, sheets, for example, as shown on the, top, uh, on the top picture, by just holding them on a subset of needles. Or we can also use uh, all the needles to hold a tube. 
Of course, the only way that you can manipulate this is with short, with short rows and tubes, so the loops can't really move around in any other way. But then again, apart from socks, you can make many other things with the structure. For example, here is a Hilbert curve that's been that's basically just a tube of the same diameter but with bends created with these short trips or short rows and you can make that on a circular knitting machine because these tube-like structures don't have an explicit seam or a or a, an edge these are called seamless machines and what they can make in terms of their design space are single tubes or sheets like the flat knitting machine so a single layer of needles was quite clearly useful. So why not increase the complexity of the system by adding two layers? Well, what does that give us? First, it obviously gives us two layers to work with. So now you have two, two layers to work with, or two sheets. But more importantly, we can now start adding new operations to the machine. The first operation I'll call transfer. What it can do is that it can take a loop that is on a needle on one of these layers, on one of the beds, and transfer it to the needle right across it. So it can take a loop on, one, on, on, on a needle on one bed and move it to the opposite bed. The next instruction we'll call rack. What this can do is that it can translate one of the beds with respect to the other one. So you can, we, we now have these two new operations apart from the net operation called transfer and rack. And why are transfer and rack instructions interesting? Because now they really let you do some new things. You can start moving loops around. On the left, you see an example where you have two loops on two needles right adjacent to each other. But I can transfer one of the loop, rack the machine, transfer it back to create some space between them. This is how you widen your fabric to go from something that's, say, three loops wide to something that's four loops wide. The second example on the right shows us using transfer and rack to overlap two loop stitches, two loops into the same needle location. And this lets you narrow your fabric so you can go from something that was three loops wide to something that's two loops wide. So now you can start shaping your fabric in various ways. And a combination of these transfer and rack instructions can also be used to translate your, the patch of your fabric from one location on the machine to a different location or to rotate it. Now, the exact instructions to come up with these transfer and rack operations we've explored in a previous work called a compiler for 3D machine knitting. So if you're interested in that, please do check it out. But for the purpose of figuring out what these machines can make, all we need to know is that we can move things around with translation and rotation. And finally, a two-layer machine is very similar to a circular machine. It's like taking a circular machine and squishing it into two, two layers, which means that we can still hold tubular structures. In fact, we can hold tubular structures of varying diameters because we can turn around at any point we want. So here you see the machine holding two different tubes, one in green and one in red. Again, this idea of being able to hold tubes of multiple diameters means that now we can start merging and splitting tubes. So we can take a yellow yarn, as shown on the left, and pick up both the green and the red tube with by knitting a row that combines both of them. And on the right, there's a more abstract picture of the same where we show two tubes uh, being merged into one yellow tube. So you can make a structure like this. Now this starts feeling pretty general because it looks like by merging and splitting tubes, we can make about just about any 3D shape. But how general is this exactly? Well, with the setup that I've shown with two layers, not all surfaces can be represented. For example, the picture on the slide gives a a surface that cannot be represented, uh, constructed on this two-layer knitting machine. What you have here is you have a green tube and a red tube that's occupying needles on both the layers, they're tubular structures, so they're occupying needles on both the layers, and they want to swap spaces. And because we don't have enough needles to execute the swapping, this particular uh, machine cannot be, or this particular uh, output cannot be constructed on this style of a machine. Now, to give a more general um, uh, definition to what can or cannot be made, we can go back to our intuition of using a time function to reason about these surfaces. So let's place a time function on this, on this uh, object to indicate how we'd like to construct it. Now, we're not too, uh, uh, we don't really care too much about the actual shape of the contours here, because as we know on these machines, we can hold sheets, we can hold tubes, we can change their shape. So we, we don't really care about how these uh, contours exactly look, but we do want to track how they move in time. And what you see over here is that the tube moves upward in time, which is 
always true in machine knitting because you're constructing things in time. But there's also an intersection that's happening between the edges of this tube, uh, edges of this particular skeleton. And this intersection is basically encoding the fact that these tubes wanted to switch places or swap places, which is not possible. So more formally, we can say that the skeleton of this time function needs to be upward planar. That is, it should, its edges should be directed upwards and there should be no intersection between these edges in order for it to be machine editable on this two-bit machine. So now if I have a surface and a time function, I can simply look at its skeleton and ask the question, is the skeleton upward planar? And if it is, I know that it can be constructed on a two-bit machine and otherwise it cannot be constructed on the two-bit machine. For example, this trefoil knot has um, edges getting overlapped at multiple places and therefore uh, intersecting at multiple places and therefore it cannot be constructed on this two-bit machine. Again, I'm skipping details on how exactly we came up with this pattern. The intuition and the idea is again to go back to the time function and reconstruct a pattern from there. Uh, we have a paper called Automatic Machine Knittings of 3D, uh, 3D Meshes that works with that. And the, the takeaway here really is that you can use your 3D knitting machine like a soft 3D printer because you can reason about whether a shape can be constructed or not and automatically generate patterns for it. So the two-bed machine tends to be called uh, seamless or whole garment machines or knit-to-wear machines uh, in the industry, uh, mostly because most of your garments, like your t-shirt, can be constructed as, as a combination of tubes and they continue to be making tubes, so they're seamless. And what they can produce are general tubes uh, that can be combined in various ways as long as the skeleton has this upward planar embedding. Now, the reason we had this planarity constraint is because we were out of needles. So uh, in an obvious question to ask ext uh, while extending this hardware uh, style is to say, can we add more layers? Can we add more needles and beds? Well, yes. Uh, here's an example of a Shima X bed machine. This machine has four layers and increasing the physical layers does allow you to make more complex shapes. But the nice thing is that we don't really need this extra physical layers to mimic this functionality. Here's how we can emulate a multi-layer machine with just two beds. I've color coded these needles into three sets. You have red needles, green needles, and yellow needles. Now I'm gonna show just one layer, but the other layers still exist. I'm just showing one layer for clarity. And I've used a red yarn and I've placed loops on just the red needles. So think of it as, you, as if you're constructing a small fabric on a small red fabric on just the red needles. I'm also going to place this in this, um, uh, I'm also going to place it in the front view just for um, easier description. Now, next, I can take a green yarn and make loops on just the green needles. So what I've done here is I've made a green fabric that's placed in front of the red fabric. So it doesn't intersect with the red fabric yet. Next, I can use a yellow yarn and make sheets, uh, make a sheet on the yellow needles. Again, there's no problem here. None of them are intersecting. We have three different layers. Of course, a problem happens when I decide to go back with my red yarn and continue knitting on, on, the red, on the red needles to extend that red fabric. Now what happens is that the red yarn ends up capturing or uh, running over the yellow and green fabric that was in front of it. But remember, we do have that opposite uh, needle bed that was just sitting free. So we could trans, and we have, it's two beds, we have those transfer operations, so we can transfer the yellow and green yarns and loops onto the opposite bed. This separates them from the red fabric, giving some space. And now the red yarn can continue producing more red fabric, increasing the length of the red, uh, of the red material. And when you think about tubes, this might seem a little bit more complex, but then you can still work, work out shuffling these layers, uh, uh, even in the case of tubes. So you can make, you can start emulating a multi-layer machine with just these two layers. And now when you have these multiple layers, you can again reason about what sort of shapes you want, you can make on this machine. But instead of having to be just planar, they only need to be planar with respect to each layer. So I tend to call these things as layer planar embeddings. And in the machine knitting world, this idea of using just a few needles, for example, if you used just every other needle, uh, it's called half gauge knitting and so on. Uh, and this gives us a way to generalize uh, machine knitting into more complicated 3D shapes. Now, one thing that's worth noting is that when we mimicked these multi-layer machines with two bed machines, we lost on resolution 
but we could make a more complicated output with a more complex uh, program. And we, this, this out, the idea here is that there's no post-processing necessary. The shape comes out of the machine directly. And of course, how robust or how efficient this is would depend on the yarn that's being used in the exact program that's being, cons uh, that's being constructed. But one could also say that, hey, if I had a circular knitting machine, I could have just made a long tube and then turned it into this knot after the fact. And that's true. So you do have this trade-off between your machine's complexity and the output complexity. Here, the complexity of the output itself is low. In fact, the resolution is also high because you can use all the needles available, but you need to do more post-processing. And again, the question of whether uh, this is more efficient or robust than the other technique would depend on exactly how much time uh, this post-processing involves and how, what kind of physical uh, yarn and uh, fabric are you trying to kind of construct. And computational design tools do have this exciting sort of space of trade-offs to explore and work with. Uh, one example of that is the wearable 3D machine knitting work uh, from Wu and colleagues that came out recently, where they work with simpler patches that can be stitched then later on to create complex shapes. So to recap, we went over what knitting machines can make in quite a bit of detail in a very bottom-up fashion. We started with, well, how are these machines made? They're made with needles. How are these needles arranged? They're arranged in various different ways. And that in turn gives you different design spaces that these machines can create. But now let's think about how do we program these machines? And particularly, how do we program them and how can we represent these programs for 3D structures? Now, I talked about individual operations that you can do on these machines, knits, transfers, racks, et cetera. And we can now start thinking about a small assembly language of knitting, if you will, to talk about these uh, operations. The only thing I need to be able to address on this machine is, well, what's the yarn carrier being used? What's the direction in which that yarn carrier is moving? And what's the needle location on which an operation is happening? And what operation is being constructed? So for example, in order to make this one loop, I can say that, we could think of it as this line of code that says the green yarn carrier is moving rightwards across needle one that does a knit operation with that yarn. Now, if I have to make a slightly bigger swatch of fabric, I can just say that, well, it's just four lines of code that basically just changes the needle number. So now we have some code that expresses this smaller uh, swatch of fabric. Of course, we need to also have uh, operations for all the other uh, uh, operations that these needles can perform. But once we have them defined uh, and we have a specification for that, you now have a, an assembly language that is complete. Uh, you can do everything that the machine can do with by just describing your, pro your program in terms of this assembly language. But of course, it's pretty tedious. Like you have to, this is a uh, very low level. What do industrial CAD tools, such as, for example, Knit Paint, which is the CAD tool that comes with uh, Shima Seiki knitting machines, which is the machine we have in our lab, but it's also a very popular uh, industrial standard knitting uh, company that makes a lot of industrial knitting machines. What do they do? They have something, a program called Knit Paint, which is a 2D uh, pixel-based uh, uh, knitting language. What you see over here is a knitting program. Each color, each pixel color indicates a particular operation. The location of this pixel in terms of the x-axis refers to which needle this operation is, uh, occurs on. And this has the um, this has very much the flavor of the layer-based uh, construction that we spoke about. So you know exactly what's happening on the machine at any point of time because you're thinking about it in terms of the machine space. Of course, figuring out exactly what is going to come out of the machine when you do this operation, these operations needs some expertise and intuition to figure that out. And uh, other design systems like Stolz M1 Plus also have a similar flavor where you're working very close to this low level machine space. Now, even within this construction space, we can abstract out some things and talk about a higher level design language. For example, we can say that uh, all we're doing over here is that we're sticking four tubes together in order to make something like a torus. And that might be much more simpler to work with than talking about these individual small operations. But we're still working in a 2D space. And we've again explored this style of a high level language, uh, a higher level language uh, for machine knitting uh, in a compiler for 3D machine knitting. And Casper uh, and colleagues have also looked at this in, the, in their work on knitting skeletons. But again, the uh, problem is that you need to know how to construct this in the flattened view and then have an, and then 
you, you don't really have an idea of what 3D structure that you're working with or that you're going to construct. Or if you have a particular 3D shape, it's difficult to figure out, well, what are the primitives you need to construct it? But can we record our knitting programs themselves in a better way? What do I mean by that? Say we have a knitting program to construct a surface like that of this bunny on the knitting machine. What this means is that as this knitting program executes, the surface of this bunny is going to get formed between these beds in some warped way. And at some point of time, uh, this machine is executing to create some part of this, of this bunny's surface. Now, it would be extremely convenient if we could directly store along with on, on, the surf, on this bunny surface, the instructions that the machine needs in order to construct this. So can we make something like that? Well, that would be a nice way to kind of represent our 3D machine knitting patterns, both in 3D as well as with all the gory details that the machine needs in order to execute it. So in graphics and fabrication, we often represent our surfaces as a polygonal mesh. So we have, say, an STL5 for 3D printing, where uh, it's easy to uh, talk about the structure that we're trying to construct. I can send you an ASCII file and you can open it up in your own system and you know exactly the shape that you that I intend to kind of create. Uh, and this makes this representation very powerful that it's it's uh, in the output space. We're talking about this in the output of the uh, object that's being constructed and not in the space in which a machine constructed constructs it. Now, obviously, an arbitrary triangle mesh-like structure might be too general for machine knitting, for knitting machines to work with. But can we come up with some sort of uh, constraint structure that has both the benefits of a 3D representation in the sense that you have an output-based system to work with, uh, as well as keeps track of all the information that a knitting machine would need in order to come up with the program? Well, how do we go about uh, having such a representation? Let's go, go back to our um, little example where we constructed this little uh, knit loop. We can think about the surface element that got constructed. We'll just draw a polygon around it. And I'm going to label these uh, edges in particular colors. I'm going to say that the green edges represent the edges across which the yarn carrier passes. And the red edges represents the edges along which the needle or the loops pass. I'm going to draw this uh, polygonal little quad again over here. And I'm going to also keep track of the code itself that was used to construct this little piece as a little face program. Now, everything in machine knitting has directions. So these edges have directions because the yarn carrier is moving either from the left to the right or the right to the left. And the needle loops are getting formed uh, one after the other. So they're going from, from the bottom to the top. So we'll add those directions or edge directions to the edges over here, and we'll record the face program with this squad structure. Now we can start thinking about making larger patterns by just composing these individual uh, faces one after the other. The face program is really just a program. It takes as input the incoming edges and produces the or constructs the operation over those in input edges to create the to create the actual net structure. There are a few additional constraints. For example, uh, the, as we walk along these edge, these directed edges, we shouldn't form a cycle. The entire structure should be directed acyclic because again, we need to keep maintaining this time order when it comes to machine knitting. Now, a nice way, like I said, to think about the face program is that the edge labels just provides a function signature. So now if I take the knit face and look at it from the back, it has a slightly different uh, structure. Particularly what's happening over here is the yellow loop appears in front of the blue loop instead of behind it. Now this might seem like a very small uh, difference, but in terms of the machine, they get constructed slightly differently. The second, uh, the second style of face, often called a pearl face in knitting, uh, is constructed on the back. Uh, for example, what happens is you take a loop, you transfer it to the back or the opposite bed, and then you knit through that particular loop and transfer it back. So these are called back knits in machine knitting or pearls just in general knitting. And again, because you know uh, a lot about these machines now, you know that you need two beds, uh, at least two layers to construct these uh, structures. But if we had those two, uh, a two bed machine, you can make these pole faces, you can represent them with this quad based, uh, with this polygonal representation, and they can make, uh, they can be used to generate these wonderful textures, uh, like these corrugated, uh, corrugated rip like structures on this knit bunny. So different stitch styles can be constructed just by altering the face programs. So this representation is pretty powerful. Another example here is to 
have uh, multiple yarns being used by the face programs, just changing which of the two yarn carriers that they would actually use within their code. So you can have uh, color work also be described within the same framework. Now, those were all quad-like shapes. And you might wonder that all that I'm saying is that you can basically write your knit program face by face. And that's not too good. But you don't really need a large number of faces. You just need a small library of face programs to construct a you know, even a complex 3D shape. For example, here I have six faces. I have a start and an end triangular face that represents just yarn coming in. I have a turn face that represents the yarn carrier turning around, like what we did at the edge of the machine. There are two polygonal faces that does the small amount of shaping operation of creating some space by transferring a loop to the left or the right or overlapping two loops to decrease the structure into a single loop by to, to sort of narrow the shape. And then, of course, we have this knit stitch that we've looked at so many times. So with just these six uh, face programs, we can actually represent general 3D shapes now. And because this is in 3D, we can use other ideas from computer graphics to start manipulating the shape in a more intuitive way. So you can start thinking about working with 3D machine knit structures as if you were working with just any other 3D, 3D mesh, say in Blender or in Maya or something like that. So we can start working with uh, these 3D structures similar to how a graphics designer would work on uh, work with 3D meshes instead of having to think about where these stitches appear on the machine and so on. So we call this 3D knitting program an augmented stitch mesh. It is a machine independent representation that captures the geometric and topological intent for machine knitting. And uh, of course, this the nice, the nice extra thing that we have here is that we can record the spline parts that are associated with these yarns, which means that we have these nice representations to extract the, the yarn itself. And th these were actually first introduced, like Steve Marshner mentioned in his talk, uh, by Jem Yuxil and Mar Steve Marshner's group. These were called stitch meshes, and they were used particularly for modeling and simulating these uh, uh, knit structures. But the focus really wasn't on fabrication. But by turning the using the same structure and thinking about them in the machine space with these uh, machine assembly languages, we can now start using uh, we can expand that structure to also record fabricable machine instructions and have a representation for three D machine knitting that is in the output space. And using this augmented stitch mesh representation that we've shown, we've developed a visual programming uh, language for machine knitting. For example, uh, you see here a stitch mesh, augmented stitch mesh representation of a little sweater. So you can imagine that I could construct a very nice uh, sweater mesh, and then I could share it with you, and you could open it up in your own system and watch and ed edit it and visualize it and know exactly the thing that that is uh, that we intend to construct. You could rapidly prototype uh, adding small electronic pieces to your otherwise regular cap. You could easily turn something like a cylinder into something more fancy, like a little hand, hand warmer, all while working in this output space. Now, I didn't brush aside a lot of details in this talk. For example, we didn't talk about how do you actually come up with uh, these stitch meshes automatically, and how do you then generate a schedule which computes the fully generated code from these individual little code pieces. But as you've seen in the previous, uh, uh, in, in those results, we have figured, how to, figured out how to do this, especially for the case of the two bed machine. And we're gen trying to generalize this to these multi-layer setups. And I think that would be really cool to kind of have a uh, scheduling, scheduling system that can work with these multi-layer uh, uh, knitting machines. So to recap, we characterize knitting machines in terms of what sort of 3D outputs they can produce. Uh, it, it's, it'll be interesting to kind of think about what other kind of uh, machine layouts can be constructed with these machines. But for these uh, existing knitting machine, uh, well-established like well standard knitting machines, we talked about a representation uh, that is uh, for, for talking about knitting programs that is both in 3D, it is mesh-based, as well as it has all the necessary information for it to be fabricated on the machine. Again, because it's in 3D, you can look at the shape of the structure and then go back and look at the design space of these machines and say whether a particular shape can be constructed on a particular machine or not.
And having such a view of machine knitting as a more general fabrication technique with good representations to describe these programs, I think is key in being able to support one of customizable manufacturing that can in turn um, sort of support a lot of novel applications in design and engineering that can be produced on demand locally. So uh, here's a small example of what something like this can enable. We recently worked on a project with a textiles researcher who wanted to make a custom wheelchair upholstery. It had some particular needs. Uh, they had a specified geometry that it needed to match and the zippers needed to appear both in an accessible way as well as not um, cause any discomfort to the person using the wheelchair. And although this seems like a fairly simple use case of all the, you know, the, uh, the 3D design systems that I've been speaking about, it turned out that they didn't have any other uh, off the shelf uh, a wheelchair upholstery that they could use. And also coming, prototyping this project was really simple because all we had to do, all we had to do was send across a few 3D files back and forth over a couple of emails, and we could quickly figure out a few designs that worked for them. Over, just over email during all this remote work period across continents. And I thought that was, that was really powerful. Like having these representations makes it really easy for us to kind of share our work and describe, uh, make edits and describe uh, and be able to just use a particular uh, program anywhere you want. So I showed a whole bunch of examples in the beginning, and I think it will be really exciting if all these all these examples could have been represented in a sort of common, uh, easy to share language or description like the augmented stitch mesh, and then it can be compiled to any of the machines that would work with those with those structures and be locally uh, manufactured much closer to you. And I think design tools should sort of work towards uh, enabling such an ecosystem. That brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, I'm very happy to kind of collaborate on machine knitting and talk more about these things. If you have ideas, do feel free to kind of send me an email. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the great talk. And we will now start the joint question and answer session. So our first question is for Steve. And you were talking in your talk that the simulation is a very integral part to manufacturing and that graphics has some things to offer. And one of the things about the graphic simulation is that it was generally designed to sort of qualitatively capture the visual of how the particular objects should interact and how they should behave. And how, what do you think is the gap between the simulations that we have now building graphics to capture the virtual worlds? towards what, how they can be applied to fabrication. Um, so there certainly is a gap. I think the, the specific gap is very specific for different types of simulations. Um, there are some areas I think where the, where the gap is small and somewhere it's larger. Um, one of the things that has to happen in order to make uh, any kind of simulation useful for uh, design feedback or for fabrication is to uh, reduce that gap enough. Pardon me. Uh, reduce that gap enough that that uh, that um, that the results are uh, qualitatively similar to what you really get in a in a useful way. And you know, it doesn't necessarily have to always be a super accurate simulation. Um, that you would, it, I mean, it, it depends on what your application is, but, but the simulation might not have to be as accurate as you might assume. And how far would you say is your yarn simulator in regards to this? This is a really interesting question, uh, which we're actively working on answering. Um, so, uh, you know, we've been making scan, 3D scans of a bunch of different types of fabrics uh, and are working on making corresponding simulations of those fabrics to try to understand uh, how well we can predict them. Um, one of the tricky things here is that uh, the thing that's easy to check is whether your simulation settles down in a similar shape to the, to the shape that the actual yarn takes. Um, but there are some other attributes of that sort of uh, state that the yarn takes on um, that are important besides just the, the shape. And in, in particular, sort of, the allocation of length to different parts of the of the structure, especially in knitting, but also in weaving, is uh, 
is really important to how this stuff actually behaves when you start moving it around. And, and this can be a little hard to tell because the yarns do, do stretch some. And so just being able to see where the yarn went doesn't actually tell you sort of how much yarn material length is actually uh, present in that area. Um, so this is a really good question. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the paths forward for being able to use yarn simulation for, um, for really detailed textile design uh, tasks is going to be you know, identifying what are the missing pieces. Um, for some cases, I think that the simple linear, they're not really linear, but the, simple, the very simplified models that we use uh, already get pretty far um, in predicting kind of, you know, a, a lot of the questions you want to answer are, are mostly geometric, like, you know, can I actually reach this? Can this number of stitches actually be accommodated in this area? Um, and some of those things could be answered without having a, a super fancy model. But if you want to do, say, appearance prediction um, in wovens, particularly, where it's very important exactly how much you see through between the between yarns that are on the top to reveal the yarns that are on the bottom, uh, then I think we may well end up needing more modeling of the compression of yarns in order to get that. And would you say that the design space is limited in general things you can achieve? You were talking that for geometry prediction, the relatively simple model already seems to be giving good results. Do you think a more complicated model would allow you to reach even more complex shapes? Or are these more complicated models for other properties, like maybe appearance or some functional properties of the art? I mean, I guess the complexity of shapes that you can achieve is probably like the boundary of what you can achieve is really a property of the manufacturing process. Uh, and I guess one question, if you want to push out toward that boundary, uh, your simulation needs to be more accurate so that you can tell where, you, where the boundary between what will knit or weave successfully and what will fail is. Um, so that's one way in which a more accurate uh, simulation, particularly one that can, you know, get out into those like, sort of more extreme cases that happen when you're pushing the boundary of what you can actually get away with. Um, accuracy in that regime will be important to uh, extending the range of shapes in that sense. Uh, Thank you very much for the answer. Now I have a question for Lydia. You were showing many cool 3D objects made out of knitting. And did you try or experiment with optimizing for other properties, for example, for their stiffness or the or the functional properties of the materials? Right. So we uh, that's, that's a good question. So we haven't. Most of our focus uh, in the work so far has been about trying to get but get to particular shapes. But then the whole idea of being able to have these nice output based representations is that we can now start thinking about well, what happens if uh, we use different styles of yarns that have different properties. Say you want to have a particular uh, structure that can take a particular load in some particular location. How do we optimize the pattern to generate that and things like that? So I guess it, the we haven't particularly looked at anything other than optimizing for the shape itself. But then I guess those are like the obvious next steps to sort of start optimizing, uh, to start constructing uh, higher level design goals and then optimize using the structures that we have to get to them. And how does this relate to the shapes that you were starting to get the overall 3D shape? Were they optimized or is there some limit how much the shape can be stuffed such that it still resembles the bunny? Or does the yarn itself capture this shape and then it doesn't really matter, you can stuff as much as you want and it will still be a bunny? That's a good question. So because these are all soft objects, it does mean that you can stuff them uh, depending on the yarn, like if the yarn is particular, if, the, if it's like you should, like general uh, clothing material, like uh, you can stuff them such that they can be changed to look uh, slightly differently. Uh, what we did in order to kind of make sure that uh, the structures that we have are indeed uh, capturing the shape correctly is to use foam forms or other 3D printed structures to cover them and make sure, make sure that they have a reasonable cover. And even for things like concave shapes particularly, because this is this can be, you can just push out a concave shape uh, that is soft. Uh, you can really represent more than one output shape with a particular uh, uh, knit structure. Uh, and that is generally, that, I mean, f optimizing to exactly get a particular shape is uh, uh, has been done mostly in terms of 
a fixed geometry without really taking into account how well uh, you can stuff it and things like that. But uh, you could imagine having uh, uh, some allowances for that, especially when you're talking about garments and fit. Uh, you might want to have allowances for how uh, well how a person moves or how a particular how you want to how you want to kind of work with some particular uh, structure to kind of make sure that it can account for the internal material changing or like the stuffing changing or if you're trying to make soft robots with this you could think about uh, how could I stuff it differently or how could the stuffing itself move to change the uh, to change the way this thing operates. Yeah, thank you very much. And now I have a question for both speakers. How would you compare the design space of weaving with the design space of knitting? I guess I could start off um, having done a little bit of work on both sides of that. Uh, <clears throat> so I think that the, the, the types of fabrics, even if you don't think about shaping that you can produce are very different. That uh, weaving can produce much stiffer fabrics that are stronger, uh, that don't stretch. Um, and for many applications that those properties are really important. On the other hand, knitting can produce much softer fabrics that can stretch a lot. Uh, and for some applications, that's really important. And so partly then some, and sometimes the material properties that you want kind of define, you know, which method you want to be using. Um, I would say it's safe to say that, that as far as arbitrary surfaces, like you can get much, much farther from developable with a, uh, with knitting than with weaving. Um, although you can, uh, there's room in the design space of weaving to sort of change the metric of your surface by sort of stacking up layers in some places and unstacking them in other layers in other places. Um, but one of the problems, and maybe this is just a, a change that needs to be made to the, to the equipment, but the equipment typically is designed to like take up the fabric at a, in, you know, at a constant rate on a roll or something like this. <clears throat> so that if you start really deviating from flat overall very far, the whole thing will just not work. Um, but it's interesting when you, when you look at what textile students do when they're given license to sort of go crazy and make weird uh, fabrics for expressive purposes, they often produce things that have like lots of extra, extra fabric in some areas that produces a lot of the buckling and folding. Uh, and, and this is quite possible, um, but it's not as typically used, I think that capability as it is in the Yeah, I don't know if you have more to, to add and you know a lot more about knitting. Yeah, I, I mean, the uh, I do agree that the a lot of the, uh, the design space, of course, we're talking about it in terms of these fixed architectures in terms of the machine, uh, but uh, to some extent, say the single sort of this, the single bed machine, knitting machine that I kind of described is it is different from a weaving loom, but it's not that different either. But then of course, like if we had the ability to sort of di do differential takedown, so you can sort of pull some of the warp threads more and then some of the other warp threads, then you can start designing designing for them also. In, I mean, changing the machine in small ways would allow you to do many more operations that can then in turn give you a far more complicated design space in terms of just the shape. But then yes, the structure of these objects, uh, the way they stretch, the way they wrap, the way they, draw, they drape a particular object changes are, is also very different. And depending on the application, perhaps uh, someone would care more about that style of uh, that variance rather than the actual geometric shape that these things can make. I see. And I have one last question for Lydia. Uh, you were talking in your talk about some new representations for knitted models and how they can facilitate the designs. And what do you think are the limitations of these representations? And what is needed to be added or improved to achieve the vision of a relatively easy end-to-end -end design that Steve was outlining in his talk? Right, that's a great question. So I think one of the, um, we, we we come up with representations that are trying to be really general and also uh, capture be able to capture the sort of output space and things like that. But then, uh, say an expert machine knitter or an expert knitter would have a lot of aesthetic considerations and a lot of other preferences in terms of how they want to create a pattern. Now that's something that we aren't uh, well we aren't enforcing it because it's like difficult to even like you know quantify that. But uh, the ability the ability to like to to explore those design spaces and to, the ability to kind of make things um, uh, to look at those kind of concentrations would be interesting. So for someone, um, and there's also a little bit of a uh, representation wise, um, 
some representations would be really nice for say someone who wants to use the knitting machine like a 3d printer i want to make this particular shape i don't care exactly how these stitches look just give me the shape and some people might want to use it as a say uh, an application to build fashion garments or maybe something that's that has a lot of intricate considerations for how you want things to be placed so uh building higher level design tools that let you make to kind of navigate the space in 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 a, in a nice way in a user friendly way would be important over and above these applications over and above these formats so even the sort of the assembly language that i spoke about well it's really nice because it's very general and it can be used as a sort of uh interchangeable file format across these different machines but then the idea is to kind of build these uh higher level tools that can let you compile to those languages uh but themselves make it easier for you to uh, explore individual uh design spaces and individual like uh, interests of a particular user. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you also both to the speakers for joining us today and presenting their awesome work on this seminar. And we will now continue with the post discussion. And I would like to invite to it both our speakers and also the audience that is watching now. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.